Hi everybody, we're Community Energy. I hope you're all wanting to be here. Um, we've got three really good speakers, but they're not going to take the whole time. The group, we as the group decided that each of them will take ten minutes, and ten. then we've ten minutes I'm told, and then we'll throw it out into a much wider discussion. So I'm hoping you'd like while we while we're having the talks, if you could have a think about a couple of things. First of all, a question to you. Are there any renewable energy people here? Hands up. What do you mean by renewable energy? Anyone who working. covers people renewable working. energy and things that they do, like what you work or your hobbies or anything. No? Ed, yeah? Anyone who works on community energy in any form, whether it's energy efficiency or helping people do the household energy or... <coughs> no, right, well that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> because I wanted to go on to say... If anybody's been working in that, then one of the things we'd like to pull out, if we can, is barriers to getting community energy going and how people might have overcome them. Yeah? Well, that's part of the topic for after the, after the talks. So we're starting with, who's our first person? It's Howard Johns, who is an early pioneer. Um, he has... Worked, he was chair of the, the Solar Trade Association for ages and built it up quite a lot. So it took it from being hosted by someone else who wasn't doing very much into a very effective association. He'd been wanting to do community energy for a while and 15 years ago, or 13 years ago, he managed to get into community energy and did the first large scale photovoltaic system at Lewis in Sussex with Ovesco. So over to Howard. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, all. So, I'm going to try and fit an hour's presentation into 10 minutes for you. So, I hope you're feeling really sleepy and I'm going to talk really fast. Um, yeah, so I, I uh, 13 or 15 years ago, I tried to set up a community energy company. Actually, people thought I was completely loony and I failed. Uh, so, 13 years ago, I set up a solar company, which is Southern Solar. Um, which I grew from me to a team of 100 people across the country and then I've merrily shrunk it down again thanks to the UK government. Um, and seven years ago I founded a Vesco, which was uh, the first community owned PV power station in the UK that I'm aware of. Um, so I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour of the energy revolution. For me we always start with that, this is the problem, flip the switch. We're, we're reliant on, in, in developed countries we're reliant on a system that was developed by our grandfathers probably 150 years ago. The basic metrics of that system are you put 100 bags of coal in at one side, 61% of it goes straight up the chimney as waste heat. That is what we have as the pinnacle of advancement. You know, only 20 units of the energy that goes in at the start end up being used by you and your homes and your businesses. Um, and that is fundamentally the problem. And to, to fuel that system, we're going to endless extremes, things like fracking. We're being sold fracking at the moment. I won't go into the pros and cons details at all. but. You know, to fuel such an inefficient system to go to such extreme measures seems totally mad to me. We're also being sold for nuclear, particularly in this country at the moment. Um, I'll just give you one number at the bottom. The estimated cleanup cost of the existing power stations is between 800 and 220 billion pounds. That's the estimated cost. 800? 80 to 220 billion pounds. Yeah. Now, when they were looking at that 10 years ago, they were estimated something like 10 billion. Yeah, so we have no idea. This is to pay for electricity that was used by our parents for the last 30 years. This is not to create any new energy. This is just to take power stations down. And that's so nuclear specifically. Or that's nuclear. And that's just this country. And you contrast that with 3 billion people, that is their access to energy. You have 1.5 billion people globally who don't have any access to electricity at all. Um, and a you know, huge form of death across the world is what's called household air pollution caused by that. Basically, so you know we've got this bloated extreme, and then fuel poverty. And actually, even in rich nations, there's loads of people in fuel poverty. Loads of people can't afford to heat their homes. They can't afford to exactly stupid system. So you've lived through one revolution. You've all got smartphones in your pocket, probably, or many of you have. That's a map of the internet. Twenty years ago, if we'd said we'd all have the access to this technology, we wouldn't have believed it. We're about to embark. We're at the start, really, of the fourth revolution, in my opinion. It's the energy revolution. And it's a similar thing to the, uh, to the IT revolution that we've lived through, partly because some of it's based on similar technology. So inside your smartphone, inside your computer, is a silicon chip. A solar panel is made from exactly the same stuff, silicon. The basis is sand. 
and it has exactly the same sort of learning curves and, and development cycle and I'll talk you through that in a bit. So in the UK right last year 14% of our electricity came from renewables. We have been going on some, somewhat of a, of a uh, mass explosion. There have been a few pioneer communities, my little crew in Lewis, um, this was our first, our first project and you'll hear from Ross later on I hope there's a whole loads of community groups now trying to do this or have done it across the UK and it's been a very exciting time but we have non-stop challenges with a government that wants fracking and doesn't want renewables. Um, but actually we've gone from nothing to 800,000 solar homes um, in about five years and that's probably why we're having such a problem. So but other, other countries around the world, I'm just going to give you a quick tour. So Denmark are already 2014, 40% of their electricity is from wind power. Some days they're producing more than 100% of their energy needs, uh, electricity needs from wind power alone. There was a day um, a few weeks ago where they were producing 140% of their electricity needs and exporting it to other countries. Mm -hmm. It's totally possible, basically. Quick case study of an island called Samso. It's out in the Baltic Sea in behind, um, in behind uh, Denmark. In 1997, there was a guy who went there to start a project to green this island. It's got about 5,500 people living on it. By 2007, 10 years later, it was net positive. They'd built offshore wind, some of which were owned by the people on the island. They built onshore wind. They built uh, district heating schemes to heat the homes using a combination of solar thermal, solar heat panels, and biomass. Um, so it's totally possible to transform <laughs> communities. And in Denmark, in general, they've gone from having no district heating schemes 30 years ago to now 60% of the population is served by district <coughs> heating schemes and many of them now are being retrofitted with fields of solar thermal. So this, that's solar hot water panels that make heat. They feed that into a big pit in the ground and they use that heat, they store it from the summer and use it in the winter to heat the buildings. It's totally possible. Germany again is another pioneer. So last year 28% of their electricity was from renewable energy and again another story. This was one of the pioneer communities um, they, uh, this, this community, Schoenhau in southern Germany, they were right underneath the fallout cloud from Chernobyl when the Chernobyl accident happened, and they came together as a community to basically repower their town. Um, it took them 10 years um, in, of fighting, and they bought back the grid in their area, the wires and the transmission system. Now they supply 150,000 people across Germany with 100% renewable energy as a cooperative and a campaigning. You know, so this is totally doable, it has been done by many people before. Um, what's happened in Germany, what the, the ownership um, of, of this new energy technology um, is transforming the market basically. So traditionally you have big companies, they own a big power station. With renewables you have lots of different people involved. So in Germany only 14% of the renewables are owned by those big companies. The rest owned by people like you and me farmers, municipalities, councils, cooperatives. So it, it changes the structure and it brings democracy often into energy, which is something that's se severely lacking at the moment. And Germany is an amazing story because uh, basically they've reached a tipping point there where the existing utilities businesses just don't add up anymore. Um, and you'll see why. These, you can't really see the colours, but these big chunks from there on up, that is wind and solar. So this is energy consumption about a few weeks ago in Germany, this is their total demand, that is wind and solar. Wow. And that's coal. Oh dear, they had to turn the coal-fired power station off that day. Mm -hmm. Now when they do that, they don't make any money and the businesses go bust. So Eon, and Eon the big company that's here and is in Germany, in Germany they've announced that they're closing, or effectively they're splitting their business in two, and they are moving forwards with renewables and energy services and they're putting all their coal assets into another company which they're going to sell off, i.e. this is a stranded asset. So it doesn't necessarily take that much to create a tipping point and a, and a big change and I think the fact that communities are involved speeds this forward. Same in the USA, um, this is a community solar garden, there's already, there's already uh, cities in the USA, uh, this is in Vermont, Burlington, Vermont's 100% renewable already. Um, it's saving people in that city $10 million a year on their bills, basically. The fact that they're 100% renewable, the way this is structured, is, to is totally doable. There's another, there's another concept from the US called community choice aggregation, um, where basically 
20 years ago, a guy called Paul Fern came up with this idea that um, councils, municipalities, should be able to sell power directly to, their, to the, the people in their area. It took him 10 years to get the first uh, law passed to make that happen. Now, one in 20 Americans are served through this mechanism of community choice aggregation. And what, what that means is that the municipality steps between the utility and the user. And they, they effectively become the energy company. And what happens, the moment, that ha the moment people sign up to this, they get a bill drop of 15% straight off the bat. And they normally get supplied with green energy pretty, pretty quickly as well. So it's transforming the US and, and, and a really interesting model to copy. And why is all this happening? <coughs> it's partly happening because of the technology. So this is solar. So 1977, the cost was phenomenal. Here we are today, an absolute fraction of the cost to buy solar. And convert, you know, consequently, the deployment oof, has gone massively up and, and will continue to go up. And you have the same story with wind. So, you know, 1980, you know, cost of wind very high. Nowadays, drop right down. Deployment oof, goes, goes massively up. And what's this doing to the existing business? I've mentioned it already. But I mean, you'll see a lot of headlines like this uh, from Europe and from the US. This is from the US. Utilities facing a mortal threat from solar. Because basically, lots of people are effectively disconnected, not disconnecting, but they're not buying power from the utilities anymore. And when more and more people do that, their businesses don't add up. And, and hence, you get these headlines. The other extreme in Africa, you know, I think it's uh, 300 million out of 900 people in Africa have no access to electricity. If they can afford it, they're using a kerosene light. That's probably taking 20% of their household income. It's really dirty stuff. It's dangerous. Um, I think people in Africa are spending four billion annually on kerosene. And then in comes the solar light. Ten dollars, five to ten dollars. Uh, people can pay for that often in five weeks. So five weeks of their kerosene bills goes on paying for it, and then they have free light for five years, effectively, or more. Um, so. I've just written a book about all this, and, and one of the guys I interviewed um, set up a company called Sunny Money, and he's now sold hundred, he's now sold a million solar lights in in Africa. And there, there are loads of great stories um, uh, of local companies and international companies going in providing solar lights. Some, some with um, uh, a mobile phone chip in them, so that you don't have to pay five dollars up front, so you can pay it in small chunks over a period of time. Um, but there's some really, really interesting business models rolling out in Africa. And the same with, with cooking. So household air pollution, I've already mentioned it, massive killer across the world. A clean cook stove reduces the amount of wood you need by half. Um, they can be made locally. Um, there's loads of great companies all over the world now doing this. Um, it transforms people's lives. It reduces deforestation. It's a massive win-win across the board. They're being made locally a lot. Too. Yes. Yeah, they are. They are. So. Amazing stuff going on. So I mentioned we've got 800,000 solar roofs, solar homes in this country. Sounds great, doesn't it? How many do you reckon there are in Bangladesh? Three and a half million. So solar home systems, they're just out there. People are really going for it in Bangladesh. One minute. One minute. Oh, I'm going to overrun by about three, I reckon. So, so Norway is already 100% renewable for electricity. Iceland's 100% renewable for electricity. It's 90% renewable for heat. So it only really now has transport to deal with, and most of that's aviation. <coughs> with all these stories, though, there's lots of battles, and we're in one in the UK again at the moment, and I'm sure these guys will talk you through the current scenario, which is not much fun, but that, it's the story of the world over. It's in, in America, all over the place. Um, but for me, this is about the opportunity moving forwards. Um, you know, there's a new story here. It's about the commons. It's about, so for me, energy provision shouldn't be a solely profit-making enterprise. It should have a social purpose embedded into it, basically, i.e. a new commons. Because there's a whole load of great things that will happen if we, if we create companies that serve us in this way. So hit our CO2 targets, reduce fuel poverty, and create a new local bank. And I'm just going to give you, in three minutes, the, the how-to guide, as it were. So creating new businesses for hope. There's four business models, so generation business, a supply business, an ESCO business, which basically means energy as a service, so it could be energy savings, or a collective purchasing, like, like the uh, community choice aggregation thing. So those are the four key business models. 
starts in your town, anyone can be part of this now. Renewables, because they're small and modular, means that anyone can be part. So in your town, you'll have a whole lot of resources you can draw on. It might be a river, it might be the sun, it might be people, who knows. It starts with people. You need a, a team of people who want to get this, get on this and make it happen. And also, technology is pretty important. There's a whole range. Obviously, I've mentioned solar quite a few times, but there's a whole range. You know, in Sweden, they do district cooling. You know, that, that could be all over the world. I won't go through all of them. It needs business planning skills, because essentially what I'm encouraging you to do, if you're up for it, is go away and create companies that make the utilities obsolete. Um, uh, and again, in my book, I go into detail of how you plan a business in this space. Um, there's a whole load of legal and permission issues, like planning permission, like how do you connect to an electricity network, like all that sort of stuff that you've got to work out, potentially, to make it happen, which is rather complex, and often you'll need to bring in experts to do so for, to do it for you. And if you're going to start a new business, you're going to have to promote it. This was us, our share launch, we got TV along and uh, got the front page of the paper, you know, we're going to create our own power station in our, in our village, and people love it, it's a great story. And then you've got to raise money to do it. So what we did was we invited the whole community in to our, this was our town hall, this was our launch. So said, come and invest, we want to raise £300,000 to build this first bit of the new power state, you know, new power system for our community. Um, and actually the government changed the rules just as we were about to launch. So we had three weeks, or we had six weeks to raise the money and build the, build the plant. We raised the money in two weeks, 350000 and I've seen that time and time again. And then obviously you've got to build it, manage it, and, and, uh, and start again. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you, that's brilliant. So it can be done. <laughs> so next we have Ross, who's been 10 years in community energy. So again, he's a pioneer, because it's not been that common in Britain yet, until very recently. He was responsible for the Berwick Community Wind Turbine, which is 1.2 megawatts, so it's not a small little beast. It's quite big, and it's well over a million quid in terms of investment. He's now working for Community and Energy England, which is a group that's come together with community energy groups and community en en energy in the now has 180 group members which is brilliant okay. far away <laughs> and that's me um, and I've put the letters after my name not to show off mm -hmm. I've put the letters after my name because nobody in permaculture seems to be doing that I think it's really important that people know that people with real qualifications with serious backgrounds are interested in permaculture and the work that everybody's doing. So, topics, I'm going to do a bit of history, um, some reflection, I'm going to cover Community Energy England, and then I'm going to quickly showcase Northeast Community Energy, which is a project I'm working on at the moment. The sun. All of our energy comes from the sun. Even the coal that we use, the oil, all the rest of it, Enough energy from the sun hits the earth every day to meet all our energy needs. Unfortunately, we can't catch it all, and even if we could catch it all, we can't store enough to go through the night. But we're working on it, so it's going to get there. Um, that's that one. And that one. And the next one. Um, we've been doing renewables for quite a long time, one way or another. That particular one was basically for corn and all the rest. It's now fitted as a hydro, um, so it's producing electricity instead. But it's been there since the Doomsday Book. It's still working. There's no reason why we shouldn't be all doing this. And biomass, that's a, a Swedish boiler. Um, although they're fairly common around most of Europe, I'm going to read this bit. Um, in 1739, Anders Johan Nordenberg wrote a paper in which he described how he'd improved the flues in the tile stones of his home in Stockholm. He advised others to do the same. The adoption of this method in the many thousands of tile stones in this great city could reduce the consumption of wood by an average of at least one cord a year for each tile stove. In this way, each household would benefit financially 
and more particularly our forests that have suffered in the recent years would be preserved for the future. <laughs> Not very recent really and as you've just pointed out Howard they, um, they're now producing them all over Africa. They, you know, efficient stones. Not exactly rocket science mm -hmm. is it? Rocket science. Fritz Solar Array 1884. That's the first solar panels. Um, the wiring looks a bit dodgy, but well, that's okay. <laughs> um, that produced maybe 1% of the energy that hit it. Um, we're now up to about 25% for a roof-mounted solar panel. And some of the stuff that's on NASA's space satellites and all the rest is up to about 48%. So you know, we're really, really starting to improve solar. But again, it's been around for 150 years. Somebody was making sure that we didn't get to use it. <laughs> However, Brush's wind turbine, 1881. Um, Brush was, in fact, one of the founders of GEC. Um, he sold it on. Um, that turbine stood there for 20 years. It powered his house in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, it never broke down. Um, when he died, it was demolished for a road scheme. <laughs> <laughs> so, reflection. Um, for over 100 years, renewable energy has been around in one form or another. And it's starting to look like the only practical option at last. And one way we can make it happens through community action. So I was going to ask if you had any ideas about renewable energy, but um, we'll skip that bit. Mm -hmm. um, back in probably the end of 2012, <coughs> the government announced a consultation on a community energy strategy. There were a number of community energy specialists uh, at a meeting in London, and afterwards we went to a pub. And at about the third point, um, we decided that one of the ways we could add to the consultation was to form ourselves into Community Energy England, because at that point we'd already got Community Energy Scotland and Community Energy Wales. And um, we were so successful that in the Community Energy Strategy, they talked about Community Energy England, Unfortunately, well, maybe fortunately, we didn't actually incorporate until four months later, so well, that was pretty much a successful idea, that one. So it's the representative body for community energy organisations in England. Um, it works with all of the other community energy groups. It's an umbrella body. If you're setting up a new organisation, it's free to join. If your Siemens or a law, law firm or whatever, then it might cost you up to you know eight to ten thousand pounds, but you don't need to worry about that. It's free at the moment if you've got an idea. Um, the next bit, I suppose, is Saturday was the launch of Community Energy in Africa, Community Energy Fortnight. Um, on Saturday, the Energy Hub was launched. The Energy Hub was funded by DEC and is a resource for people to utilise almost like a wiki or an encyclopaedia. It's got on it projects that have already been completed. So if you've got an idea, go on, utilise that, find out what other people have done, find out how they've done it, copy it. Um, Howard's book might cover quite a lot of that as well, so there's another chance to get an extra set of thoughts what we're trying to do there is make sure that people don't have to do all the learning all over again for every project. Um, when I set out on the Berwick Community Wind Turbine, effectively I got an A-level in physics and that was it. Um, it took quite a lot of understanding about the engineering, the project planning, the procurement, the need for a MET mast, what bankability is all about, all that sort of stuff. And most of it will be on the, the energy hub. And Northeast Community Energy, um, which is again a doing it project. It's been endorsed as a national pilot by Community Energy England. 
and it's now been recognised as a national pilot by DEP, that's the Department of Energy and Climate Change. Um, it's working across all four strands of the community energy strategy, which fit in with where Howard was on the, uh, the project. It's capacity building, energy efficiency, energy management and energy generation. Um, what we're trying to do is effectively to take European structural and investment funding through the local enterprise from the local enterprise partnership and to utilize that as 50% of the funding for a whole raft of projects in the northeast as we develop those projects we will again document them and put them onto the energy hub so that the the whole range of projects will be there the the hydro schemes the anaerobic digesters the wind projects the photovoltaic, the um, passive solar, we're doing a couple of geothermal schemes, there's um, a whole pile of um, knowledge between Newcastle and Durham universities on utilising old mine workings and drilling further down into them, so you can take heat out of the ground and put in district heating schemes, so we'll see where it goes. And that's pretty much it, thank you for listening to me, I'm going to be happy to take questions, and over to Kim. Thank you. And thank you for sticking to time as well. It's very impressive. Right, now we have Kim, who works at the uh, world famous Central Alternative Technology at McCullough. And she runs the media and communications section. And she's particularly a campaigning activist and writer and has done a lot of work on energy related to what she's going to talk about. She's been working in these issues for quite a long time. We had a discussion about how long a long time is. But well, we worked out it was 20 years and I panicked because I was like, I don't want to say it's 20 years. But yes, I've been working on energy democracy issues uh, for, for a long time and I also write on it as well. Um, I haven't got a power point presentation, I do apologise everybody. I'm probably going to be reading off my notes a bit because I, even though I tried to memorise my talk, I probably won't be able to. Um, do you want to more light? No, it's fine, I can see yeah. perfectly well. And also, um, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, a project from the Centre for Alternative Technology called the Zero Carbon Britain Project and looking at some of the barriers to community energy in the UK. So I apologise to everybody because it's going to be situated in more of a UK context. But hopefully uh, we can then open the discussion because it would be very interesting to hear about people's experiences from other, other countries in terms of developing community renewables. Um, it's a little bit of history about the Centre for Alternative Technology. It's based in McCuntleth in Mid Wales. Um, and it's an environmental charity that was set up in the 1970s with the idea of informing, inspiring and enabling practical solutions for sustainable living. So very much a solutions-based organisation. Um, it initially set it up, was set up as a living community uh, by a group of people who wanted to escape the, the rat race and go and live in the countryside and explore alternatives to fossil fuels. Um, and then after they started in 1975, a couple of years later, they opened the doors to the public to come and see what they were doing and uh, have a look at this crazy experimentation that was going on. And that meant that more and more people came to the area. Um, and now Cat employs around 75 people. and. Uh, has a kind of vast network of people that have taken part in courses or come as volunteers or are graduates from our, from our graduate school of the environment. Um, we also have a visitor centre which attracts about 50,000 uh, people a year and the visitor centre really is somewhere that you can go for a day visit to kind of get an idea about what renewables are, what permaculture is, what organic gardening is. But the main thing we do is the educational work and we, and we run a lot of short courses and a wide range of subjects. We've got our graduate school and we also work with schools and colleges around sustainability and low carbon technology issues with, with children of school age. Um, and that's all very well and good and that's all very nice and lots of people come and it feels great but we've also got this big question about what is the bigger picture uh, with all of this. So in seven years ago we launched our first Zero Carbon Britain report um, and that report basically brought together policy makers, academics, campaigners and activists in different fields to look at how we could decarbonise different sectors. So we looked at the transport sector, we looked at the uh, home, and home and building sector, we looked at energy efficiency and um, came up with a, with a plan to how we could decarbonise the UK by 2030. 
And then it didn't happen, although the Liberal Democrats did take the title and go back to head office and come up with their energy policy and called it Zero Carbon Britain. Mm -hmm. So in 2009 to 2010, we released our second report, which was called Zero Carbon Britain 2030. And in that report, we, we did a very similar process, but we looked at how if we power down the UK by 60% through energy efficiency, energy efficiency measures, we could meet that reduced energy de demand with a thousand, with a hundred percent renewable energy mix. So we produced that report, and then everybody said, "Oh, but you can't really do that. Renewable energies can't keep the lights on." So then we did another report uh, where we took real, real raw da data from from the amount of solar and wind and rain that hit the UK over a ten-year period, and we matched that to the energy demands, and we worked out that yes, with one hundred percent renewables, we can keep the lights on. Um, so it's all, you know, it's all there for us. And then, uh, in fact, I've got a, that report. I've got a little, if anyone's interested, a little short summary of the key findings of that report. Um, and then last week, we released another report, and I hope they're not all gathering dust on people's shelves. This one's called Who's Getting to Zero? And really, this came about is we know there's lots of different people producing decarbonisation scenarios across the globe, so we wanted to put them in one place. Uh, we work with an organisation called Track Zero, and this, uh, this new report has got 100 different decarbonisation scenarios from, uh, city, from a city scale to, to a countrywide scale, and also includes decarbonisation scenarios for 16 of the world's largest emitters. And alongside this report, we've also launched a live research project called Making It Happen. And I suppose the premise of the, the Making It Happen report is the science is saying we must do it. The technology, as these, this report shows, they're saying we can do it, but why is it still not happening? Why are we still in this situation whereby carbon emissions are increasing and we are facing the kind of the temperature rise that, that we are facing? Um, so the new project we've launched, which is a live research project called Making It Happen, is really about looking at what are those barriers to change um, and how can we overcome them. Um, so just a little, a little bit about energy democracy. A big part of the, the Zero Carbon Britain project is this idea of energy democracy. Um, and that really is looking at how the power that we generate and its distribution can be owned by the people. And the uh, revenue generated from those projects can go back into those communities. Um, and that comes really from the idea that for, for more than a century, we've been living in a world where the dominant energy paradigm that we have is a highly centralized, corporate-owned system where the generation and distribution is owned by the few. And particularly in the UK, we've got these big six energy companies who are raking in vast profits. Well, it doesn't have to be like that. We can change that. And energy democracy means that community residents take, take into, take uh, energy production and generation into their control and are the innovators and the planners and the decision makers and how to use and create that energy. Um, so we see glimpses as, as Howard and Ross have shown, we see glimpses of it across the world where people are uh, starting and where there are very successful community energy projects. There are many in, there are many in the UK as well but it's amazing in Wales the fight that we have just to put up one single turbine generating power which makes money for the local community. Um, and uh, making it happen, the new project from the Centre for Alternative Technology really wants to try and address these thorny issues and try and tease out the solutions and work together with other organisations and people to look at how we can overcome those. Um, and when I started to write this talk a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, um, I started to write a list of things that, are, that cause barriers to community energy projects. Things like the lack of standardised grid connection, lengthy planning processes, a lack of clear vision, a lack of clear direction from local authority. And I'm still going to talk about those because they're all very important. And in order to see a massive rollout of renewable, community renewable projects, we need to see that those things being dealt with. But then that was before the Conservative government um, announced their course and consultation into the feed-in tariff scheme. Do, do people know what the feed-in tariff scheme is generally so um, it's been a basically a way of, of people being able to finance generating their own energy so there's been a big uptake you know in particularly in, I think in rural areas of people being able to put up wind turbines or solar panels and get money for the power that they they generate through those schemes 
The biggest emerging threat to community renewables uh, in the UK at the moment is our current government, who are systematically <coughs> dismantling the renewable market, the renewable energies market with a great vigour. Mm -hmm. They've taken away the onshore wind farm subsidies, um, and now these, if these proposals for the feed-in tariffs go, to go ahead, it, it could pretty much sort of kill or certainly cause serious injury to the renewable energies market as it is at the moment. And it feels it's crazy in this day and age, especially with the build-up to the Paris climate talks, that we have a government which is going steadily backwards. Um, and I have, this, it's a, I have this kind of game I play with myself sometimes. I think, if I was in government, what wouldn't I do? And then I look at the paper and find out that the Conservative government do it. So it's like things like, I wouldn't remove student grants for people from low-income families. Oh, oh, they've done it. I wouldn't remove feed-in tariffs because they are reducing carbon emissions and they are creating jobs and they are generating money and power. But unfortunately, they're removing the feed-in tariffs. So it's kind of, we're in a kind of quite a depressing, depressing time. But I think from that, we need to see this as an opportunity and need to work out ways that we can work together in order to overcome these, these challenges that we're facing. Um, and what's very sad about it is that in January 2014, the UK government, the Department for Energy and Climate Change, released the, the country's first community renewables energy strategy. Uh, and Ed Davey, the then the, the head of DEC, said at the time that we need to make community energy an easier option, achievable for, by more people. We need to mark a step change in the sector and lead to sustainable and significant expansion and send clear signals to the market that yes, community energy is viable and we're supporting it and we're going for it. And it's such a shame that 18 months on from that, we are now in the position where we're in where lots of community energy projects are, are kind of you know, in limbo, if you like, waiting to see what happens with this new, this, the, the proposed changes. So one of the things we need to see is clear leadership and commitment from the UK government. We haven't got it. We need to push them to it. Um, and we might talk about that a bit later. We've had a little chat before this talk and had some ideas about what we might do. There also needs to be clear targets and obligations for councils uh, and local authorities to create ambition and drive that change in supporting renewables. So I know, for example, in Paris, where, where we live, we have a huge issue with the planning departments who hate renewable energy and they hate wind turbines. We need to see that change. We need to see local authorities having an obligation to back community energy projects where, of course, where they're, you know, where they're sensitively placed. We also need to see standardised processes uh, to make it easier for community groups to, um, to set up community energy schemes. It's a very complicated process. There's a lot of administration burden. There's a lot of negotiating between different, en different entities like Ofgem or the district network operators. So really to support community groups, we need to see clearer, easier to use processes which take away from, from those kind of more complicated things. We need to, um, in Denmark and Germany, renewable projects are given priority access over the grid and it's actually part of an EU renewable energy directive that renewables should be given priority to grid access over fossil fuel projects. That isn't currently happening in the UK to my knowledge and that should change. We also need policy to make it easier for community groups to, to pay for grid connections. So a grid connection can really vary in, in its price and depending on whether or not you can get a reasonably priced grid connection, it can make a project uh, doable or not doable. We need to find a way of making that easy for community groups, either by them paying the cost for the grid as the project develops or by um, giving them a significant discount. Um, and another thing that, that, is, that would be vital, and it does happen it, it, with community groups like Community Energy Wales or England or Scotland, is really providing a supportive framework so that once a community group forms and they've got the idea for the renewable energy project, they can get help from beginning to end with planning, feasibility, financing, legal structure. So there's a, a turnkey service for community groups in order to be able to implement their projects. And the other thing that I think is really important is, is a public relations campaign. I personally find community energy very sexy. There's nothing better than a group of people generating their own energy, creating, getting money, and getting together and, and doing it. And I really think we need to be telling these stories and multiplying them. Um, if we were to be able to get to the stage where we had this kind of support for community energy projects, I think alongside that we need to see uh, marketing and public relations campaigns to support those things. 
And the other thing I feel, and this is probably a bit naughty, but I really think it's time to start differentiating between the large wind farms and the smaller community projects, because I think at the moment in the public eye, they're all very much lumped into the same, there's a wind turbine, we just don't like wind turbines. But there's a big difference between 70 wind turbines on a hill and five wind turbines which are generating energy for a um, and income for a local community. So perhaps teasing out those differences more might help. Certainly in Mid Wales, we, we have a very big anti-wind lobby and it makes any sort of wind turbine very complicated to put out. And, and just to sort of finish, well, that's good, I'm just going to finish, is that energy democracy is a vital part of building a zero carbon future. There's no longer any check that disputing the climate science. We know it's happening. And we have a choice now, which is to be ch change or be changed. And Naomi Klein, who, who wrote the book, This Changes Everything, which came out earlier this year or last year, um, has it, they've got, she's got a new film. And in the new film, she says this, this statement, that what if, if this is the best opportunity we have ever had to change society? And I think it probably is the best opportunity we have ever had to change society. Because not only are we talking about tackling climate change, we're also talking about putting into systems, into place, which are more democratic and bring more autonomy and more, de more um, ind independence for people. Um, so we need to be working, with, we're, I mean, we're stuck in the UK with this government for the next five years, five years, and we need to be working out a way to get around this system. We need to be them, challenging them, but we also need to be making them increasingly irrelevant. And, um, <laughs> And there, was, yeah, and there was this talk by Andrew Sims from the New Economics Foundation. He gave a cat the other day, and he said, it's all very great us all being calm and rational, and it's all very nice that we do all these nice permaculture projects and do all this, all this type of stuff. But actually, it's probably time for some of us to get really angry. And I think that's true, and I think that's what we need to start doing if we're going to be able to build the future we want to see. Thank you. <laughs> discussion around these topics and you've heard quite a lot about where we're at worldwide and the UK and some of the opportunities. Um, can, I, can I ask a question of the audience? Yeah, of course. I'd like to know what countries are represented and what what situation people are dealing with in their countries. Because mm. there's so many countries here, obviously it's going to be very different. Can we have a quick, quick once round of where, where everyone's from? I'm uh, living in West Africa, where a lot of the things that you've referred to uh, are very alive and well. And uh, I'm particularly interested in the future of mini grid systems as community energy systems, yeah. and finding ways of uh, bringing in that kind of approach, uh, because solar powered mini grids would be just it's fantastic. fantastic. Anyone else? Different parts of the world. Yeah, I totally agree with. Uh, so, well, maybe I should say, who's from the UK? <laughs> Let's get that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, if you haven't got your hand up now, tell us where you're from. Well, could I make a point about Scotland? <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, go for Scotland. I'm in the UK, but you know, a lot of what I'm hearing, you know, you know, Scotland has its got its own issues, and you know, I'd like to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, and it has its own funding. It's a completely yeah, exactly. different set of. So, if your hand wasn't up, where are you from? Ireland. Ireland, yeah. Kenya. Kenya. France. Australia. China. Chile. 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 That relate to what you've just heard about. I'd really love to hear some. Um, I, we're running um, eco village design <coughs> education courses and uh, spreading uh, the, the, the kind of concepts of renewable energy alongside permaculture, ecological uh, notions, etc., and spreading that across very, lots of different villages. And we're now talking about translating some of the uh, Eurocentric uh, materials into local languages so that we can spread the word a lot more. We've had our vol volunteers over from America to teach uh, people how to make rocket stoves, which are more efficient, yeah, fuel yeah, efficient yeah. stoves. Yeah. And uh, 
Our friend over there, Alaji, is actually now part of a small cooperative which is beginning to make, sell rocket stoves. And also the other thing is solar lights and small solar home systems. Uh, the, the kind of mantra for the solar lights is if it costs less than a candle a day, it's a good scheme, and there are those coming along. They, don't, they provide two or three LE LEDs, uh, not much more, um, but it's beginning to come, and it needs early sponsorship, which is one of the issues. And then people then, as it were, on a lease scheme, as opposed to buying it, and then m money coming in is used to buy more lights. Yeah. I'm happy I, I attended this session, because I think, I have benefited quite a lot. When we are talking about energy in Malawi, we are actually talking about a very, uh, we are talking at a very lower level, perhaps energy to save a, a wood. I mean, uh, I, I saw the example there. But I have seen that you have gone quite at advanced point, but more especially I like the idea that people are actually having a, a contribution. I mean, you are democratic. Um, if there is democracy in the, in the issue of power, you find that uh, this issue of electricity is just equally like uh, an issue of food security. It is politicized in Malawi. You know, you have uh, to, to indicate, to show to people that you can do something else if you want people to work for you. And the, you know, in most cases, what happens is that, uh, you know, people will just promise. But now I like the idea that people themselves in the community, at, at a community level actually are beginning to uh, uh, provide initiatives to look into their uh, issues of energy. I think that's uh, a good thing to go for. Although we know that there are miles and miles to, I mean, for us to, uh, uh, to be able to reach at this point. But uh, however, I think uh, you have done quite a lot. Great. Is there any other country? So I'm sort of jumping in. Sure, right. Chile. I'm from South Africa, from yeah. the training centre in the village. Uh, John, as you have spoke yesterday about nodes, uh, it's important to have centres of excellence. And we have a situation at the moment where probably between 24 hours a day we don't have electricity. It's called load shedding because there's not enough electricity in, in the world. Often in, in South Africa, I mean, on a Friday, Johannesburg runs to a standstill. But in the area where we're living, there's not enough, enough electricity because people don't have food, so the lines are being stolen. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to ask, you've got amazing systems here for supporting people and communities here. It's one thing to put a little solar panel on, on one house, but is there any chance of, of um, organizations here maybe supporting some of those keynotes that can you know, spread uh, what you're doing? I think that's what it's all about, yeah. Mm -hmm. China, well, in my country, I don't see any coordinating movement about these, just local things, persons and house. Uh, and for me, it's like, uh, you know, the future, so... There, there, is, there is a massive uh, merchant, i.e. commercial renewable energy movement in, in Chile, but mostly around the Atacama Desert and all the mining operations. Right. So feeding straight into them, and there's not, as far as, I'm, as, far as I'm aware, anything that's for the people of the people uh, at this moment. But there okay. is lots of renewables growing in, in Chile. So there's a, a generally identified need then for lots of individuals who want to be part of community groups to get together with other individuals and start developing, as mentioned, the node idea and incubators and all that. Doing the same thing for energy has been suggested for general permaculture. So that sounds like a really good thing to take forward for each area to start going on knocking on doors, assuming people have got doors, to say, let's get together and let's make our energy together because the technology is available. And it's not that expensive anymore. The Western model of subsidy, so it brings the price down, has brought the price down really well. So it can then go out to lots of areas where there isn't a subsidy and stand on its own two legs, feet, head, rooftops or whatever. So that sounds like something really good to take forward for everybody. Are there any other particular, other than getting groups together, any particular other issues that people want to, to raise? I don't know if it's appropriate to go into it today because there are so many people not from the UK. But I subscribe, I'm a CAP member, I make more electricity than I use, I subscribe to Zero Carbon Britain. 
but I'm also a member of a community that fought off a wind turbine, and I know a lot about why you're batting your head on a whip ball, and I would like the opportunity at some point to feed it back to the relevant person, cool. persons. Because you said it's the time to get angry. Anger begets anger. Yeah, and true. recently, I think I know why there is so much anger against wind turbines in Shropshire and the world. Is that right with the others if we had something on that? Yeah. Would you like I, to just spend a couple of minutes on that? Well, I, mm. I, I wonder whether we want to descend into an anti-wind yeah, debate yeah. in this. No, but because she knows why people are like that, just the reasons behind it might be okay. useful, not the actual, because hopefully everybody here is pro-wind, <laughs> but the reasons why. I'm interested here, just in terms of the challenges that actually yeah. people face. I, I think and it doesn't apply perhaps to other countries. We should take a few, so we should take a few, but, a few air things. things. Um, in, the list in, in the UK, the facts are facts. My local town had a sustainability group with the highest of motives. They thought it'd be a good idea to put up a wind turbine in co a combination with uh, an industrial company, Critter. And they basically didn't think about what the rest of the community thought. And they teamed up with the most unpopular farmer in the area, uh, who everyone hated for tearing out his yes. hedges and not allowing people on his land and otherwise upsetting folk, who was very well off. No one wanted to make him lots of money. And he, they did a presentation along with him and they said, oh, you get 10,000 for some community project. You want this in your backyard. And I'm afraid, you know, if facts are facts, this was a, not a poor community. 10,000, they thought it was going to devalue their houses more than 10,000 apiece. 10,000 wasn't what they were can interested I, can in. Can I butt in? Because I think, I think the key Is thing that here, not relevant? No, no, it's, it's relevant. But if people had been invited to own that term, they probably wouldn't have objected, and, and that's that's where community is so important. I think that's very likely true. Um, but what happened was, of course, everybody who had an anti-wind time turbine argument pulled out of the woodwork. It'll be noisy, it'll upset your health, yeah, yeah. it'll do this, it'll do that. There was an anti-Bridge North wind farm movement. Yeah. They had parties. They got but, really I mean, strong. That's, it, I, mean, I think that's just an against. exemplar of why community is so important, mm. yeah. and why and maybe we can bring it back to the conversation about communities and, and if there's and any pressing. Things every that time want we have a lecture about whether it was a good idea, you know, from somebody, they just got further entrenched. There's a whole community there that's almost got anti any sort of wind turbine anywhere on the planet because it's just. You know, they've got entrenched in their adverse okay. position. Yeah. I think I think one of the questions I always have about this is is the bigger picture because I I mean I uh, we do a lot of uh, media stuff and it's we actually do have an energy crisis. Where is our energy going to come from? And um, we are at a point at this this moment where by community energy, which is community owned energy owned by the community generating power, that money going into the community seems to me like an absolute no brainer. We're going to have to get our energy from somewhere. I would rather see a wind turbine than a fracking site, personally. And I think that's, that's what we're kind of moving to. I'd rather see a wind turbine than the extension of Wilford B or another nuclear power station and the resulting electrical pylons that have to go with it. So I, so I think there's, I, I often try, when we have these debates, I tell you, can we step out of our entrenched positions, because people get very emotionally entrenched, and try and look at the bigger picture? Can we come together and work out how we would like to see our energy supply? It's, it's all about how it's done. If it's done yeah. to you, you're going to fight it. And yeah. the classic, I interviewed yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this community in Germany uh, called Feldheim, and, and the, the, the guy said to me, yeah, basically, what your neighbour's pig smells like shit, mm. your own pig smells fabulous, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what this is about. You know, if you have a stake in it, you're going to love it. If you don't, you're going to fight it. Simple as that. Yeah. You, you know, so there's a chapter. Don't, don't you think we need a cocktail of renewable energies 
depending on where you live. Of yes, course, absolutely. Well, you've got to, to have that. But yeah. so <laughs> often there's an emphasis on wind and solar. But you don't, they're not really thinking about small hydro, geothermal, mm -hmm. air source, heat pumps, all those different things in current power. Mm -hmm. So on the, on the coastal areas, more of an emphasis on that. And yet I don't hear that spoken very expressively. When that, we talk about renewable energy, it'd be well, nice that could to see be though that, that the resource base is so much bigger for wind and solar. Yeah, the it's, hydro it's, it's actually is small. and they're more commercially viable. And the well, tidal tidal stream and the wave is not technology. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story about That's Vesco. So when yeah. we started seven years ago, the first thing we looked at was hydro. We spent two years and twenty thousand pounds on studies to get to a point where we could have a viable scheme, and then it got turned down by the Environment Agency. Okay, so you could spend a lot of money wasting time on hydro. Solar, you can build it in six weeks. So um, you've probably, those in the UK have probably heard of Balkan, um, the first fracking village. So I got called to a public meeting, a bit like this, there, and I did that sort of talk and said, right, who's up for it? Then about five hands went up that they were up for being a director. You'll see in the news in the next few weeks, actually, um, that hopefully they'll be granted planning permission for a five megawatt solar field, mm -hmm. which will be 100% community owned. You'll all be able to buy a share in it. Um, and uh, they would have repowered not just their town, but the neighbouring town as well. You know, and I think it's about seizing those moments where, where people wake up to stuff, fracking in some way. I think it could be an opportunity, because people are going to find mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. For me, it's less about getting angry and more about getting organised. You know, but anger, actually, I mean, okay. I think when people get angry, they get emotional and they want to organise. Directed that's, angry, that's, yes. Yeah, directed anger. I'm not talking about it's all about eh. But I just, I just like the idea that we're at this moment where we need to be standing up. And we were talking before this, like people are feeling really demoralised in yeah. a new book. I mean, like people in mid Wales are really upset. There's so many small businesses that are going to go under. And I feel for these, all my friends, you know, who've got these small companies, that employ five people, and that's it. And I, I actually that. feel very upset for them. And... That upset, that anger that I feel, you know, I would want to generate into something and, and uh, turn into something book, positive, you know. With, dealing with three years of, you know, I spent ten years doubling the company every year to have a hundred people, and then we had a change in policy and I had to sack everyone. Yeah. You know, so. So there is a lot of good learning from that. Quite a few communities have actually responded to threats by getting together and saying, right, it's doing something. So we just had about Balkan. Wade Bridge in Cornwall did the same thing. They were threatened with three supermarkets surra surrounding the bowl that the, the town is in. They had a big meeting. Various people talked to them about different things, including me, talking about energy things. And in a pub afterwards, yeah, let's do an energy group. And they made huge progress in the following two, three years. So if a community can identify threats and get together around getting rid of that threat, or in our case we're talking about the community, energy community, mm. the threat, as has been said by everybody here in the UK, is the present dinosaur administration. So then that's the threat that has to be, come, that has to be countered by gathering together and making them irrelevant in some way. Yeah. I just wanted to say about the, I understand, I thought, that Kirklees, they actually worked with the local authorities, in fact it was a Green Party who I in, took, took the sort of process forward, and they've got thousands of houses, council houses, with solar panels on it, which actually enables the tenants to pay less bills, but also enables the council to actually make money out of it. And with the current situation with local authorities being strapped to cash, this is a unique opportunity, surely, for maybe more local authorities to be approached on this? One, one, one launched its own energy company this week, which is the first new municipally owned energy company since 1948. It's called Robin Hood Energy, and its sole purpose is to you know, address fuel poverty and generate energy locally. So it's Nottingham. Nottingham. Oh, right. I'm not surprised. <laughs> and the local authority is like the capital for the... This guy has had his yeah. hand up for ages. Yeah. Um, that chap a lot of this is, con at least in England anyway, and is concerning rural areas. Um, I've grown up in London, I've lived in London most of my life. Um, and for me it's quite a barrier to feel like I can do this. Community is a lot more disparate in London, and it does not have that kind of feeling of being able to get together and do things. It's a lot harder to go knocking your neighbours' doors, and that's a personal barrier that people have as well. 
Um, I don't know personally any organisations in London that are kind of moving yeah. towards this as well, so if there's any information on that, yeah. that would be really helpful. So Repower London, um, set up about four years ago, I was involved with their first, their first project which was Repower Brixton. Um, and the story of the Brixton project was awesome. It's, uh, the, I think it was, it's the estate that they were working on. Um, it's one of the, uh, what do they call them? The areas of highest deprivation in the UK. So people are like most likely to be on benefits. You know, no savings, all this sort of you know, poor diet, all, all the different indices that people have. For, you know, being having a hard time. Basically, they're in this estate, um, and these guys went in there. And basically went around and talked to people about you know what can we do to make life better in this estate, and they eventually um, basically ran training program for the local people on the estates uh, around uh, uh, fuel poverty, so trained people how to fix this leaky building that they were all living in, and then about a year later when they went back and said, actually we want to build a power station on the roof of this building now, you know who's up for it? 90% of the money for that power station came from people within the building, you know, which is meant to be the poorest, poorest community in, in the country. So it's happening in London, it's happening all over London, there are repower initiatives all over London, um, and it's totally possible to do it in cities. And one of the girls who was involved in the job ended up being seconded to the government for six months, which, you know, going from nowhere to suddenly you're working for the government, brilliant. Well, at the back, guys, I'm just going to ask a related question. Can we, can we come back sure. to somebody at the back? I just want to thank you for yeah, all your stories and presentations and how um, really positive ones. I'm really intrigued about kind of the barriers sort of culturally. Um, I don't want to sort of bring it down, but I think Pam's alluding to that because really it's fascinating. Like you were saying, you know, the sun washes up upon us all, and you know, who wouldn't want free energy? you're in control of and potentially making money. So I just wondered, from each of you, kind of, have there been any themes in maybe some of the resistances to community energy and maybe more widely well. renewable? Is there, have you noticed any kind of trend or anything? Because that's quite interesting. If, if we're sort of agreeing largely that this is a good thing, then how do we meet people? How do we make it relevant, even though it seems to equate, you know, Okay, well, the first one to point out is that the government's own figures say that 65% of the population are in favour of renewable energy. <laughs> so, there are a lot of people who are undecided. It's probably down to about 20% of the people who just don't have the imagination or, for some strange reason, have a loathing of whatever it is. Um, is it, is, it, is it not our duty to understand that, though? Well, it is, yes. but I, I it's also our duty to try and persuade these other people that... But you can't I, I don't, persuade I don't think this is about people. I think this them. is about corporates. Yeah. So basically, right now, we have six companies that provide all of the electricity pretty much across Europe, E.ON being one of them. Now, when I was writing my book, I interviewed Hans-Joseph Fell, who was the guy that created the first feed-in tower, or one of the two guys in Germany. And he just said... The energy industry are doing their damnedest to destroy renewables because effectively it will destroy their businesses and they know it. Um, and he said, you know, first of all, they go through the uh, official lobbying means, and when that doesn't work, eventually they bribe and they're, you know, they're corrupt, basically, is what he said. So he, he's an ex member of parliament for the German parliament. Um, in the UK, I interviewed a woman called Laura Sandys, who was a PPS to Greg Barker, the energy minister. Um, she said, the utilities know their business model is over. And what they're doing is playing for time. They know they've got yeah. 10 years and they're looking for 20. Because right now, if you've got a billion pound power station and you need X amount of sales every month to make it add up, and you can see that being eroded by renewables, you're going to do your damnedest to stop renewables. And that, in my opinion, is what's going on. And that's why it's so important. It's communities coming together. Because when I do it as a commercial organisation, they just pitch me on the meet. You know, I did it. I did Channel Four News. I took the government to court. All sorts of stuff. You know, they just pitch me as self-interest. Oh, it's this other corporate group, and oh, well, they need subsidies, and these guys don't. Which, of course, we all know which now is rubbish. Is rubbish mm -hmm. That fossil fuels get more subsidies than renewables anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, so to me, it's about corporate interest. And I also just adding on to that because I was going to say the same thing, and I was going to say, oh, I'm going to get all conspiracy theorists on you. But um, no, I absolutely agree that that we with that's what we're saying. But I also fear. 
that a lot of the anti-wind lobby has been whipped up by vested interests. So it's worked very well for the Conservative Party that we've got all these anti-wind people going, oh, the landscape, the landscape. I don't really think that my local MP cares that much about the landscape, but he says he will. It's a very industrialised landscape already, by the way. It's, it, it, it's tree plantations and sheep farming. It's already industrialised. Putting up 10 wind turbines on those areas doesn't change it. Um, so, I, so I think that is, it's being used and it's, and it's manipulating people, actually, I think. And, and then you look at media coverage. So studies done on media coverage, overwhelmingly the media coverage of renewables in this country and America, it's something like 85% of the stories that they run about renewable energy are negative. Mm -hmm. you know, no wonder people hate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bring on the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> but picking up what was said earlier, because I've been in renewable energy for a very long time, one of the things I learned early on as a wind farm developer was always ask the landowner if they get on with their neighbours. Mm. If they do not get on with their neighbours, walk away, mm. straight away. And the other way around. Uh, well, <laughs> yes. Have you fallen out with any of your neighbours was an early question. Mm -hmm. Because if they had fallen out with them, you yeah. didn't want to know there was no chance of getting a wind farm. That's what the point, yeah. two points are. Very it's all about up. relationships, One existing is relationships. The same group of people that fought this wind turbine are now supporting a knife farmer to have a solar farm on his land, though it's also going to cause disruption mm. and temporary problems to the hedges. Partly because he says he'll put the hedges back, we know him, we trust him, he'll do it. So, you know, it is a question of, and you've got to understand where people are coming from. I'm a doctor. It's no point telling people, smoke, you'll get cancer. You have to put the carrot, not the stick, to get people on your side. And they, the MP was in favour of the wind turbine, big business, big farmer, conservative folks. When he realised the whole community was against it, of course he was against it, because his MP <laughs> wanted the, the votes. Right. He wasn't the Conservatives affecting the people, this time it was the people affecting the Conservatives. This case it was. And that's why we need a community energy movement, and so also that the, people the, affect the politicians. Yeah. The, the reason they were able to do it in Germany was specifically because they had the community yeah. behind. Yeah. That, that guy's been waiting for ages. Well, I think this gentleman, that gentleman has been waiting more than yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, my, my question is about, yeah, is, do we have to, when is it possible, like, do you, like I've heard that the, the raw material for building, like, sheep stockings, raw material for, for example, building sheep for computers, and you said it, it's the same thing used for, solar panel, so is it possible to turn the entire planet into solar and wind? And and do we and how much embodied energy in there in the, the process of building that? Yeah, yeah. And the mm. the question also is about do we have to? Like for example a tree I've heard is like one single tree is like like several hectares of leaves. So it's it's it grows for free. Uh, couldn't we use like the, the trees energy instead of investing energy in, in building solar panel? Can, can we use what what's already yeah, there I mean, for us? There's, there's a few there's a few questions there. Um, I mean, in terms of the energy that goes into could renewable you, energy. Sorry, could you just open again all the questions? Yeah. So, well, the questions I'm going to answer are okay. like the embodied <laughs> energy, the, ask, the embodied <laughs> energy that goes into creating solar and wind. Mm -hmm. So how much energy goes in and what's it made from? So, so solar is made from sand, refined sand. You basically bake it in an oven. In an oven. Sand is the most abundant mineral on Earth, basically. Um, in terms of the energy payback, you're looking a year to 18 months for both a, a solar panel and a, and a wind turbine. Yeah, wind is shorter. Nine months, maybe, for wind. Really? If it's windy enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, Not in central cities. Whereas for, for a nuclear power station, I think you'll probably never get Energy payback. It's on twenty that. years. Well, no, because you have got to take it down afterwards. What? Well, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, and in terms of biomass, yes, we'll need all the sources. What I would say is that the conversion of the sun's energy into electricity or motive power, let's say, is more efficient from a solar panel than it is from a field of biomass. Mm -hmm. So you're actually better off mm -hmm. having a field of solar panels than having a field of biofuel, for example you get more power out of it, but we will need it all, basically. In Britain, in medieval times, 
20% of the land, the, the um, cultivated land, was used for transport fuels. Hey, for horses. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot more people now, so it would be hard to do that, but we have in the past seen a lot more of the land used for transport. You've got a point. I was going to ask a slight, I'll make a slightly different comment, and it was related to the question at the back, uh, more to the back about cities and renewable energy. One of the things that is, seems to be happening a lot in the States is that communities which are urban are starting to invest in um, renewable energy microgrids. Mm -hmm. yeah, and amazing. that seems to me not only a very good solution for America, but also for communities, urban communities in this country. And I was going to say, is there any kind of move in that direction? I, I mean, in the UK there isn't because we've got such a, a, a big infrastructure already and in that we've got a grid to plug onto and that's actually far easier to do. Mm. Um, in some of the communities in Germany, so there's a one, one community called Feldheim and they basically tried to buy the grid back, the utility wouldn't sell it to them, in the end they just built their own. They just said, okay, we're just going to plug, disconnect from you entirely and we'll have our own grid well, locally. Nice. But Microgrids, I think, are most applicable in, in, in nations where there's nothing. Because obviously you can start. Well, that so is true, but in America, if, if your scenario is correct, that yeah, yeah. Uh, the big companies are going to go bust, uh, more and more communities perhaps could look for yeah. another solution. Well, and that's how it used to be, you know. Yeah. Certainly in the 1920s, so between 1890 and 1920, you had an energy revolution globally, yeah. and it was called the electricity revolution. And yeah, there is a microgrid movement in the States, well, which is yeah, developing yeah. now. I don't know if, well, if anybody wants to check out some really good software called Homer, H-O-M-E-R, they've actually got teachings on, my, on how to do renewable energy projects, and they've got stuff on microgrids, and it's for free. It's one of the very good environmentally good things the Canadian government have done. <laughs> and as Howard pointed out, um, there is this aggregation issue. Um, yeah. In the UK, all of the energy is effectively controlled by Ofgem, and unless you have a license, which costs about a million pounds a year to administer, uh, then there's no way you're allowed to buy and sell electricity and to distribute it to customers. So, what we're trying to do is to build enough capacity in generation to put together an ESCO, an energy service company, to be able to increase our energy prices. Because the, the big issue there is when we generate from a wind turbine or an anaerobic digester or whatever, we're getting maybe four or five, or possibly if we're really doing well, six pence per kilowatt. But when you're one of the big six, they're selling at 14, 15 pence per kilowatt. So, you know, we I mean, that, that's the way around. Some for, stacked up against us. For that, that is the way around, I think, to, to this current situation in the UK is for utilities to be set up. But I urge anyone who's in an area without a grid, build a system that's bureaucratically simple. <laughs> <laughs> Do not follow the rich and complex British bureaucracy system because it's rubbish and it's really hard to make big change. But if you're starting from scratch, Try and make it simple bureaucratically to make that happen. Because there's enough technical issues and people issues without adding to it with more bureaucracy. And there, and there is a company out there doing that. They're called Village Infrastructure. And what they've been doing is going into various different countries and just going into a community and saying, OK, would you like light? Would you like a meal or whatever it is that, that would be really important for that community? And then building a microgrid for them. Um, uh, using sort of crowdsource finance from the West, uh, empowering one person in that community to basically be the energy entrepreneur and run this thing. Um, village infrastructure. Um, a guy called Stuart Crane, who originally set up a company called Barefoot Power, which is one of the largest solar light manufacturers in the world. Really, really great guy. Um, but I think that's a model that's so replicable. Yeah. Man in the striped shirt. Yeah, I was just going to ask um, if you could comment perhaps on the benefits of the community uh, energy companies as opposed to investing in somewhere like Ecotricity. Ecotricity is owned by one man. He's called <laughs> Dale Vince. He's a hundred million pound company and he owns it all. Yes. So the benefits for a community. Energy companies, aren't they? That, that yeah, but 
maybe, guess, maybe Ross could say all right. something on that. The 1.2 megawatt wind turbine that we put up in Berwick upon Tweed um, cost about £1.5 million pounds at the end of the, the process of planning application, commissioning, getting it to run, certification, all that stuff. Um, most of the money was in repurchasable equity, but there's a pile of money on top of that. So at the moment, it's earning roughly £45,000 a year for the community. Um, that's going through the Berwick Community Development Trust. It's paying for one job, and there's a small seed fund. At the end of seven years, that changes into something like £200,000 a year. So the community then gets an open bidding um, fund that anybody in the community can bid into for anything. They've just got to get the support to get the funding go that way. Um, there are other schemes like that. Um, you were talking about microgrids or um, how to utilise both rural and urban. One of the projects we're doing is Holy Island, which is a small island off the northeast coast. Um, there's no way that you'd ever put a wind turbine up there. It's a placid, peaceful, <laughs> listed, <laughs> everything um, island. So we've teamed up with two other communities in the southeast of Northumberland, which are mining communities, and we're building one wind turbine between the three communities. So there's two urban communities sharing with a rural community. Um, so what you're saying is it's the add-on benefits yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. basically it's, it's not going into somebody's yeah. back pocket we're saying for the Brixton, community. With the Brixton project, the whole point of that is it's about creating well-being for that community. Mm -hmm. And they have a fund every year that they come together and decide what they want, what they want to spend on, whether it's sending someone's kid to college or if it's insulating their roofs, you know, they can decide. And that's going to be there for 25 years. Yeah. So it's about creating these engines of well-being in, in communities. That's, that's what it's about. Or generating your own independent income stream. Yeah. <laughs> and some communities have actually started doing their own community energy stuff off the back of the community payment from a local big power company owned wind farm. So, for example, in Glendarool in Scotland, they've been getting 30 grand a year, I think it is, from Crookmoor Wind Farm. And they use that money to pay for a project worker, first of all. And now they've done loads of community things relating to permaculture quite a bit. You know, they've got a couple of community um, polytunnels because the growing conditions are really bad there. They're doing green heat, so they're, they're managing some forests and taking the wood to heat the local houses. And they're developing their own wind turbine idea. So they've taken a commercial game into the community to build their own community thinking, which is brilliant. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, just to say, just from the, you know you're talking about microgrids. There is actually an example on the Isle of Egg yeah, uh, yeah. in Scotland where they have built their own, um, they basically all their energy is renewable and they have their own storage systems. And so, just going on for that, I live on the west coast of Scotland and we have loads of you know big wind farms. And we probably produce enough electricity to power all the homes in our area. So, but obviously, you need to store the energy. So I was just wondering what you might know about energy storage systems. Do you restore renewable energy? Because obviously, you know, it's windy some days and not other days and things like that. Okay, it's still pretty much down to batteries. There are storage. Yeah. There, there are a large number of organizations working on advanced technology. Um, and on Friday there's um, the Energy Saving Trust, Ashton, Department of Energy Climate Change having a meeting in London about community energy storage because community <coughs> energy is something again different you know, so the storage of community energy is something again different from the scale of commercial energy so commercial energy might be capable of pumping water uphill over the night um, to then release through a hydro mechanism it's quite unlikely that most communities are going to be able to do that in the short term so almost where I started we've got all this sunshine and it produces more energy than we could possibly ever use most of it is reflected back it's a matter of being able to catch some of it and store it and you're quite right bringing up storage because it is the most important that's the next, that's thing, the next yeah. step yeah. Yeah. I mean but there's various ways you can store it as hydrogen you can store it 
in pump water in various various ways. You can store it in compressed air. There's there's a whole load of different projects around the world where they are doing that. In Chile, in fact, there's some big battery storage on the grid there um, to, to deal with the peak loads. Mm -hmm. So often you only need storage to deal with that 15 minutes a day where you get these massive spikes in demand. And actually batteries can do that. But for me, the most exciting one um, is the thought of electric cars. Um, so in Japan, um, post Fukushima, there was a massive rollout of renewables. And obviously Nissan's from Japan, they launched the Leaf, which is a 100% electric car. Mm -hmm. So with that car, you can plug it in to charge it up, but you can also have it to run your house. So at <laughs> night time, if the grid goes down, you can run your house with it. Oh, it's hard. You know, so to me, that really is where this is going. You know, um, that small small storage in your home, um, potentially using the transport system as the store as well. Mm -hmm. I think will be part of it. So um, the, the the person to watch is Elon Musk. Um, so Tesla Motors in the U.S. Um, great great visionary classic businessman, um, he has two companies, or he actually has three companies, but two of them are uh, Solar City and the other one is Tesla Motors. And Tesla's just launched a home battery storage product. They've just set up this thing called the Gigafactory, which it will build more lithium ion batteries than all of the lithium ion battery factories in the world combined in one site. So it's just doubling world, world production in one factory. And that, I think, will drive massive change. Well, and I just wanted to, can I just add, uh, um, as, as well as looking at storage, it's also possibly important to look at ch lifestyle changes. So, for example, lots of people put on their washing machines during the day, and it would be better, for example, if we programmed our washing machines to start in the night where there's less, you know, where there's a different sort of energy demands, and kind of plotting it like that is, a, is another way around the kind of storage issue. Or well, if you've got PV and run it in the day. <laughs> if you got or people run in the day, or you've got wind. You know, there's kind of there's ways of managing it with more smarter, smarter appliances, basically that can know when to turn themselves on and off and that kind of thing. But already in Denmark, where some of the utilities have um, apps, mm. and it tells you we've got loads of power at the moment because the wind's blowing. Use everything, or power's yeah. power's going to be more expensive at the moment, mm. so turn everything off. Mm. You know, it's, it's simple. Well, with the technology that we have now, it's very possible to get people to manage the grid for us. Mm. But even on a much slow, slow, lower scale, there's a couple of projects in Africa where there's a wind turbine, but it's not by the village. So somebody has a battery which is charged up from the wind turbine, and then they cycle it, cycle the battery back to the village, and then people can charge up their mobile phones from it. <laughs> that happens a lot. Yeah, yeah it works quite well, because it meets that, their local needs. But, and when we have... Um, washing machines and dishwashers installed in our electric cars. <laughs> <laughs> As the wheel goes round. <laughs> um, we are getting sort of vaguely near the end. Um, Kim has already suggested that we um, look at the feed-in tariff. Well, there was an. I, I was talking to Ryan. If it, Ryan is Ryan here. Ryan from the Permaculture Association, who's doing the press. We were talking about trying to get more mainstream media coverage for the conference because they haven't had any, and we were thinking about what to do. And we were talking about the situation in Calais and whether or not anything would be coming out of this conference in terms of groups of people supporting refugees in Calais. And then it occurred to me, because Howard's bringing out his wonderful book next week, he might want a bit of advanced publicity, um, that we are, I'm from the Centre for Alternative Technology, he's from Solar Century, he's from Community England, that possibly it would be a good idea to do a press statement or a press release coming from the Permaculture Association to the Conservative government asking what their plan is. I don't quite have the question in my head, but something like... Uh, what? <laughs> Are you doing it? something like given the new given the new uh, consultation to feed in tariffs uh, and the and the community energy strategy you brought out in January 2014? What you know? Can we have a clear statement or vision on what you see the future of community renewables is? Um, and it coming from the Permaculture Association conference, the, this conference and various other organisations signing onto it. So we did vaguely talk about that. We've obviously got to word it better, but. Um, from my perspective, um, the announcement that the government has made has made ha, has created so much uncertainty mm. that we already know that a large number of commercial organisations are going sod it, mm. we won't bother. Yeah. We'll just put it in a file and 
at some point in the future we might look at it, we're not going to do it. And sack everyone in the meantime. Yeah. Community energy doesn't really have that opportunity. Mm. Now is the time to go. It might be because there is a line in the community energy strategy about the idea of community energy being a special case. Mm. It might be that we would be able to say we want to see the government continue to support community energy initiatives, which might mean that in some way they're looked on favourably in planning, or it might mean that the government continues to um, ensure that the community energy unit exists within DEC or DEFRA if DEC disappears. It might mean that um, the pre-accreditation, which you probably don't want to listen to really, continues to exist, or it might mean that the feed-in tariff is skewed so that there is a community energy feed-in tariff mm -hmm. rather than you know, an open-to-everybody feed-in tariff. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, the community energy feed-in tariff is probably the one um, because everybody in the country can see that it's not commercial, it's community mm -hmm. energy feed-in tariff. Mm -hmm. What do people think about that as an idea for us mm. to take forward and work on? Good. Any comments? Yeah? Good. 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 Uh, that, sounds, that sounds a good idea, but because, because obviously everybody recognises that a certain amount of new housing is needed, part of that approach is to say, hold on a minute, shouldn't all the new housing adhere to strict eco-building criteria, of which renewable energy is a fundamental part of that, and then that will feed into the community energy side of it and create just more... The government's back. just thrown that out. For the last 10 years, the house builders in this country yeah, will work into zero carbon by next year. Yeah. Six months before it comes into effect, after 10 years of preparation, they just said no, they're not doing it. Even the house builders are complaining. Oh, I see. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they just so lost the plot in terms of our survival in this present dinosaur administration. So they're just happy to carry on with the same... No, I think if we're going to get anything that gets any press, we're going to be quite focused. Because um, if you read The Guardian, you'll know that the UK government just wiped out nine policies to do with renewable energy and cutting carbon. They just wiped them out. Even though there was no demand for some of those to be changed. They decided, don't like it. Ideologically. Yeah. yeah. So, with, for no particular... Yeah, it's just illogical. To, to it's clear illogical. the way for shale. Sorry? To clear the way for shale, yes. But some of it's not even related to that, is it? Like the vehicle excise duty, which was favouring lower carbon vehicles yeah. and penalising Porsches and gas guzzlers, actually is now being wiped out and everybody pays the same, regardless of how rubbish your car is or not. It depends if you're if you're some, if you're funded by the fossil fuel industry or not, doesn't it? Really, I mean, it is corporates, but governments go by funding. The Conservative government gets its votes from Porsches, not people yeah, yeah, that drive their many cars like me. But we, we, we are sort of out of time, so we just need to maybe just focus. Does everyone think this is a good idea? And anything, yeah. right? If we just spend five minutes for those that want to stay, who want to put input into that, and the rest of them, thank you ever so much for coming. I'm thank you for the speakers. And there's some leaflets and things here as well. Yeah. Those are interesting. Lots of info. Energy